Good boy, Royal. Yeah, you're beautiful. You're beautiful. Buddy, I gotta get a little movie of you. There you go. Maverick is a Labradoodle. Somebody snapped at somebody at the beginning, 
That's a misunderstanding. Then we've got to work away from that, which takes longer. So you keep them apart, let them see each other, and then a little closer. And then if there would have been some aggression or growling, then that would have told me that we have to keep one on the leash or both on the leash. But as we got closer, it was kind of like, eh, no big deal, right? And then they were smelling each other a little bit, maybe a little bashful. They, they're not playing, that's fine. They're staying apart and we can be good with it. So yeah, so yeah, usually try to schedule with me, but you know, these spontaneous things, we know how to handle it. Because remember again, I'm in charge of the safety of everybody in this room, animals and people. And I have about three seconds to decide if a dog coming in is going to stay or not, right? So be aware of that. But as uh, some of you heard me earlier, I was a dog in a former life. So then when a dog sees me, it actually sees a dog, not a person. And so that's something I live with. It's not a bad word. Okay, so tell us, Taylor, stand up and tell us about Shadow. Don't call Shadow over. He's trying to thermoregulate to the floor. So tell us about Shadow. Okay, so that's weird that you call him that. I mean, not shadow. That's funny. Royal. Though, because that's the last time I had. But okay. um, so this is Royal. He's five. Uh, he's a, obviously a Labrador. Um, no, I'm not. Okay. Uh, he's kind of an obsessive, compulsive mama's child. He never goes anywhere that I'm not going. And I wake up and he's like here. Um, but anyway, he used to be a show dog. Um, and then I neutered him because I don't need to be having dogs right now <laughs> in college. Um, what else? Uh, he is actually a hunting dog now too, so we go to Kansas and uh, hunt pheasant and that type of thing. He is, was an aspiring duck dog, but he just <laughs> I likes, remember that. He just likes to lay in the pond. Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to retrieve but, and get in the pond, but not at the same time, so it didn't work out too hot. Uh, but anyway, so that's what he does now. Um, I also take him to like the nursing home. My grandma recently went in, uh, so now he goes and visits the people there. Uh, although he's just pretty much a giant black dog. So. <laughs> um, actually, so he was here last year. We did a DNA swab on him uh, to see what his DNA profile looked like. Um, so not surprisingly, he's a Labrador. <laughs> um, what else? That's just about it. He likes his belly rub, and uh, <laughs> yeah. He's good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is great. Okay, the next uh, order of business is anybody have questions? I've got two I'm going to go over that have been submitted, you know, on that website. I think it's called uh, 230 Questions. Is that what it is? Or yeah, that's how it is. Okay, Jams, what do you got back there? If we ever introduce an animal, is that going to be on the, like, for third, that oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I probably won't ask you pet names and all that stuff. Now, what we're going to do with Royal is we're going to calculate his blood volume. And then, okay. of course, that's fair game. Okay. Okay, so let's do that. He's 80 pounds. So how many pounds of blood does he have? Can you do mental math? He's 80 pounds, and how many pounds of blood does his body contain? <laughs> pounds of blood? 5.6. 5.6, right? It's 80 times 0.7, right? You know it wouldn't, it, so you can, yeah, on a multiple choice, you know it would be less than 7 because it would have to be 100 pounds to get 7 pounds of blood. See how you can mentally math that? So I have, he's 80, so he's 80% of 7, right? So he's got uh, 5.6 pounds of blood, and that would equal to 5.6 pints, right? And if you did 5.6 over 8, that would equal how many gallons he has, right? So write that down, 5.6 divided by 8 equals gallons, because there's 8 pints in a gallon, right? And you know a pint is a pound the world around, right? And it's, it's interesting, yesterday, one of my TAs from last year, Rochelle, who's in vet school down there a few blocks away, she even texted me and showed, she showed me um, one of their blood calculations. She said, your class has definitely helped me prep me for vet school, and she sent me a screenshot of blood volume calculation that they're doing. Because the other 
good thing about this, knowing how much blood they have is, and then if you can, so if you're ever in a situation where an animal has lost blood and you can kind of get a good handle on it, then you can say, oh, this is dangerous or not, right? 10% not a problem, usually 20% not a problem. This is a healthy animal, right? Remember that woman who wrote the article on the horse thing? She said 30% or less, right? You don't really worry about a transfusion uh, until you get about 30% blood loss. So you can take a lot of blood out of a big animal. I remember one time we had this cow that was bleeding and we took two gallons out of a donor cow. Two gallons, 16 pounds of blood. And that talking about that article, see how this, this all is amazing. That article that was recorded for last week said something about glass inactivates the platelets. Do you remember that part? Now here's what really happens, and it's kind of interesting, I, I know why she said it that way, but glass is negatively charged on the surface, tends to be. And make sure, I'm going to check my little notes because I want to, yeah. Glass has a negatively charged surface, and somehow when platelets get exposed to the glass, listen to this, it, so, it sounds like I'm saying something uh, absolutely opposite of what Margaret said. When platelets see that negatively charged glass, they sense it, they're activated. Therefore, when they get transfused into another animal, they're not active. And so therefore you could say they're inactivated. You know what I mean? So it's actually kind of interesting. The article said, and I, can, I know why she said it, right? They're inactive once you transfuse them into somebody else. But they got activated in the glass container, that's why they're inactive in the the uh, recipient. Isn't that interesting? And hopefully that wasn't confusing, but I was reading the other night about glass. I had to refresh my memory and it's got a, it tends to have a negatively charged surface. When the platelets sense that, they get activated and therefore when you transfuse that blood into another animal, the platelets aren't going to be active. So Margaret said they're inactivated. <coughs> well, active, well, they're, they're Platelets are good at plugging things and it, uh, releasing some chemicals. And so they do that activated, yeah. So they're activated kind of like they're ready to make a clot. Long story short, yeah. So would that happen in like a plastic bag or two? No, no, that's the other thing. Yeah, so then if you ever donate blood, how many donate blood? What's the container that's rocking? It's some kind of plastic, yeah. And it's rocking because you have to mix the anticoagulant. Otherwise, the anticoagulant might be in part of the bag and your blood will clot in another part. So it's always moving, right? Yeah. And if you have anticoagulant and you have a test tube from a bowl or whatever, you always mix it gently. You gotta make sure the anticoagulant is mixed up. And so platelets that are collected into a plastic are ready to work if they're given to somebody else. Okay, just a very interesting point. Okay, anybody else have any questions on that? Okay, so I have a few little things here. Um, okay, yeah, okay, I guess let me do these two questions. Let me do that before we uh, run out of time. Okay, so one question was, what does exudates mean? Or what do exudates mean? Whatever. So let me do that. Exudates. Now remember, what I would do is I went to my big textbook that has infinite images and I looked and I've never seen this before but I thought this person made a great example of transudates and exudates so let's look at this because now we got to know both <clears throat> okay a transudate versus exudate this is fluid appearing on like if you ever get a kind of a bad wound there's like this mm, fluid on top Okay. And it tends to be an exudate. Okay, but if it's clear, it's first a transudate. Okay, so formed in the earliest phases of inflammation. It's got a low protein content, so therefore it looks kind of clear. Uh, not many cells, low tendency to clot, so it's kind of liquid. And then as you go on, it becomes more of a true exudate. So an exudate can be either on the surface of the skin, of an animal or internal, 
but it tends to have a high protein content, so it's gonna be like thicker. Um, let's go to high cell count. And we'll, when we get to immunology, we'll talk about how white blood cells can leave blood vessels. They have a mind. They can leave blood vessels, they can enter blood vessels. Platelets can't do that, and red blood cells can't do that. But white blood cells are amazing. They can leave a blood vessel, like let's say um, I got uh, like a nail puncture wound. What proves that my white blood cells are leaving the blood vessels and going to that wound? What's the evidence of that? The evidence that white blood cells are leaving the blood vessel and are helping you with the wound. It's a P word. Pus. Pus. What is pus? Pus is white blood cells. Neutrophils to be exact. N-E-U-T-R-A-L-S. Neutrophils, sorry. That's not how you spell neutrophils. Let me spell neutrophils for you. <laughs> neutrophils. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Okay. N E U T R O fills. P H I L S. Neutrophils. So pus is neutrophils plus dead tissue. Uh, is pus specifically dead white blood cells or can it be both alive and dead? Well, mostly dead. Because if it's mostly neutrophils, they're very short lived. And they're going to like, they're phagocytic. There's another word, right? and they tend to die fast. So most of the pus, I, I bet you could probably find some live white blood cells, neutrophils, but most of it's dead. They're dead white blood cells. And that's why pus tends to be kind of whitish, isn't it? You said that pus is neutrophils plus what kind of tissue? Uh, necrotic tissue, dead tissue. And here's a little sidebar. There's so many sidebars. Do you know some animals and people can't do that very well? Their, red, their white blood cells don't really want to leave the blood vessel. And we can talk about it later when we do immunology. But some people and animals are very poor pus formers, and then <coughs> therefore they have trouble with wound healing. Pus is a good sign. And there's a, it can be genetic, where the white blood cells, those neutrophils, don't want to leave the blood vessel, and the wounds stay around longer. So many little avenues to take. Okay, anyway, um, so you know, you'll see this word exudate a lot more. It's that kind of fluid on top of a wound, okay, but it can be internal. Transudate might be the early phase where it's clear, okay? Okay, so then let me see if there is a picture. Oh, here it is right there. Perfect. More pure fluid, and then we go to the next few days. Definitely, this has a lot more protein in it, because right? that's, that's kind of looking like plasma, isn't it? Okay, and it could have cells. There's probably some cells on the bottom. I don't know if they spun that or not. Okay, so that was one question, and then, I mean, these are profound questions. Here's the other good question up here. What's the difference between pneumonia and pulmonary edema? And these questions show that people are studying and they're having some conflicts and they need some resolution and that's why we meet here to do that. It's a great thing, pneumonia versus, the question is, pneumonia versus pulmonary edema. And the difference is, in pneumonia, and I'll show you pictures, in pneumonia there's usually a pathogen. <coughs> Pathogen, right? P A T H O G E N. And a pathogen is a disease causing organism, a disease causing agent. That's a pathogen. If you have a pathogen in your lungs and you have this fluid collection, it's called pneumonia. If you have the same situation but there's no pathogen, then you usually call it pulmonary edema. <clears throat> so you can have pulmonary edema, edema without any disease. It can be messed, messed up things with uh, pressure, uh, how much protein is in the blood. So let me show you a picture of this, right? Where I go, I go to my textbook. And let me make sure I got that question here. Yeah. 
and so we're going to do pneumonia. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Uh, where, oh, there it is. Okay. So the first word. Okay, pneumonia. Then, of course, images. And then we're going to look at images and we're going to pick out some good ones. Um, let's see. Maybe this one's okay. Now, remember, this goes back, that's why you watch the video, because in this week's videos, they were talking about the fundamental, the uh, functional unit of the lung is what's, what's called what? The alveolus, right? That's singular, and alveoli is plural. That's the functional part of the lung, and there's like all these little white, all these little sacs. <coughs> there it is on the screen. And air comes in, a lot of tubes, and I think one of my videos says, from the trachea down to the last air sac, there's 22 or so <coughs> forks in the road. Okay, there's division, division, division. So then, these air sacs are not supposed to have any fluid in them, with one exception. That What's the molecule that keeps, what's the, maybe I should say, ingredient that keeps the alveoli more round? It reduces the surface tension of water. Surfactant. Surfactant, okay? Surfactant keeps the lungs, uh, the, the alveoli, more like a ball. But there's not supposed to be fluid in those, the lumen, L-U-M-E-N, right? There's not supposed to be fluid in the lumen of the air sacs. In this picture, I don't really like it very good, but it ends up being, say, fluid in the alveoli. That's pneumonia, and that's pneumonia if there was, like, a virus around or bacteria or something, some pathogen. You know, there's viral pneumonia, all that stuff, right? Okay, so, but you would call this pulmonary edema if there wasn't a pathogen. So it's basically the same thing, but what's causing it, okay? Now, what I want to do is use the document cam and draw something. And I think I'll go to the document cam now and draw that for you. It's one more. Yes, okay. So I'm going to draw one <coughs> alveolus. <coughs> And then, see, if you're studying this, you do this, right? Because you, you know, do and understand. That's the air sac. Air comes in, air goes out, right? What percent of oxygen in this air right here? 21% of this is space is oxygen. What's the major other gas? Nitrogen, about 78%. Okay, so anyway, Ah, uh, blood vessel. Here's a blood vessel. There's, all these alveoli have a blood vessel by them. There's red blood cells. Am I almost there? So those are red blood cells. I won't draw white blood cells in there. There'd be white blood cells. But for every thousand red blood cells I would draw, how many white blood cells would I have to draw? One. one. Thousand to one. <clears throat> so this is flowing this way. <laughs> say. And then you have oxygen in the lumen coming in. And it's going to diffuse this way. Remember diffusion. The one thing you got to remember is diffusion is passive. There's no, nothing is making it work. Things go from high concentrations to low concentrations. So the concentration of oxygen in the lumen better be higher than it is in the blood. Because that's diffusion. If it was the other way, it would diffuse this way because it's brainless, it, it's, it's a physics thing. So then, obviously, the oxygen is gonna bind to hemoglobin, right? And be carried to all parts of the body. Now look at how oxygen has to go across the membrane of the alveolus, this space, which I'm gonna lay <coughs> and then the blood vessel wall, and then it has to get into here. And that whole complex, and I'm sure it's mentioned in the videos, is called the diffusion barrier. It's very important that this has a minimum space. 
the diffusion barrier has to be small. I gotta go reset my camera. I usually set a timer. Oh, Maverick, you're doing good, buddy. Hold on. I don't want to disturb you. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, this is kind of fun having two dogs. It's a two dog day. Okay, so diffusion barrier. Now, in pneumonia, you'd have fluid in here. I don't want to mess up my drawing yet. And in a pulmonary, pulmonary edema, you'd have fluid here. But I want to talk about this space. Because if that gets too big, then you have less oxygen being picked up by the blood cells. And that space is called interstitial space. Yeah, it's coming out. And sometimes in pulmonary edema, edema this gets big too. It fills with too much fluid. Because edema, just the word edema means excess interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid is in the interstitial space. Okay, so this is fluid. It's always fluid. So oxygen diffuses across, but in pneumonia, now I'm going to change this to pneumonia, okay? There's fluid. What's going to happen with the transport of oxygen to red blood cells? It's not happening. Too thick. And that's the trouble with pneumonia or pulmonary edema. You tend to have a lack of oxygen. And of course, if it's severe, that's terrible. So that was a good question. What's the difference between pneumonia and pulmonary edema? Not much, but usually most people would agree that pneumonia is caused by a pathogen, and you get fluid in the lungs, not only here, but sometimes excess here. And pulmonary edema is caused by uh, non-pathogenic factors, like messes with a blood pressure. So you said that's the alveoli? This is the one alveolus, that black thing. That's one alveolus, one air sac because you want to focus on that. And there's, you know, a million of these. Anybody else have a question? Okay. Now, Aaron tells me yesterday uh, we might want to review today action potential, so I want to go through that, okay? Because where did that come up? Where did the action potentials come up? Because usually we do that in neurology, but how did that come up? Oh, about blood flow of the heart and innervation of the heart. Oh, innervation of the heart, okay. Yeah, and since somebody had a question, let's, let's do it a little bit. Action potential. Because sometimes, you know, you never know how these work out. Of course, I'm going to go to the images. I'm going to pick out a beautiful uh, one right here. I'll make it a little larger. Okay. Oops, sorry. Thank you. See, I've got this screen and it's perfect, but it's not there. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and do that. Here it is. I typed in action potentials in the Google textbook, and here it is. Okay, now we're looking at one action potential, and we'll say on one nerve. And we'll do more of this in neurology, but since you guys talked about it, yeah, you know, the heart has extrinsic innervation, right? Nerves coming from the outside, but you cut those and the heart still works because it has intrinsic pacemakers, right? Because look at, uh, in human medicine, when they transplant a heart, do you know they never connect the, uh, the nerves back? So how, do, how would their heart react then if they're like, supposed to get afraid and their heart mm -hmm. Yeah, you know how like you're walking on the trail and a bear jumps out at you? Uh, you're, a person with a regular, your own heart with uh, be faster and quicker, but the thing is, in the heart transplant recipient, their adrenal gland still releases epinephrine and stuff. There, it's the adrenal gland. We'll get to that. Yeah, so they can still increase their heart rate when they see the bear, but it's not as good as you. And there was one nurse, and maybe I can find it. She wrote up this article, which was fantastic. It was called the Denervated Heart. D E N E R vated, denervated heart, and that's what every heart transplant recipient has. It's a denervated heart. All the pipes are connected, 
but the nerves are not connected like you and I have, okay? Because there's nerves that come in that can speed up your heart, and there's nerves that come in that can slow your heart down. Have you ever heard of people dying of sadness sometimes? They think they're, the, the nerves that decrease, decrease heart rate are overactive, and it just stops the heart. But it's called the denervated heart. X, oh, she just had a great article because she was in cardiac someplace. Okay, so here's an action potential. An action potential is, well, let's say nerves have like a resting potential. That means there's a separation of charge. We'll get more into this. And you, you had some of this in biology 110. And that's called rest, resting state, resting threshold right here. And it's often given as minus, minus 70 millivolts. <coughs> And then there's going to be some stimulus that changes or decreases the uh, resting potential towards threshold. And threshold notice isn't zero. Threshold is above resting, but it's never zero. Okay. And if you get a weak stimulus, you'll get a little change in resting potential, but you won't get an action potential propagated on the nerve. So actually, let me show you this one here. Here's, the, here's what the true drawing would show if you're just talking about that little blip. It would be this line, that little blip, and then this, and nothing else. Just a little blip, but it failed to reach threshold. So like, let's say if it was a light mosquito that landed on one of your pressure sensors. If it did this, your brain wouldn't get the signal that something landed on your so this is called a sub-threshold stimulus. Now let's say two mosquitoes land on that spot. That's this other line here. Your brain won't, re won't know it, but something's happening to your arm. There's two mosquitoes sitting there, but they're not heavy enough to make an action potential or to reach threshold. But when it does reach threshold, let's say a horse fly lands on that same spot, they're heavier. <coughs> then you get complete depolarization so you get this spike up, and it pa shoots past zero. So for a minute, it's on the positive. But then there's channels and mechanisms that want to get back to resting, and so they repolarize. So these words are tremendous. So there, this is polarized. That's depolarized. This is repolarized, and sometimes we shoot past resting. And that's called hyperpolarized. So look at all these words. Polarized. Depolarized, repolarized, hyperpolarized. And then, but it comes back to resting. <coughs> On any given nerve, this height never changes. So if you have six action potentials, you bet your last dollar they're all the same height. So on a given nerve. So, like, what if I had six? One, two, three, four, five, six, I don't have enough screen, but they'd be the same amplitude. Amplitude never changes on a given nerve. Now the nerve next to it might have a different amplitude, but on one, any given nerve, the amplitude never changes. So how do you know it was a fly versus, okay, let's say a horse fly landed on my big toe, I'm barefoot, I could feel that, but then what if Royal stepped on my toe, or let's happen to me before, a big cow. I know there's a difference in intensity, right? How does a nerve tell the brain that something bigger is on your toe than a horse fly? Uh, well, yeah, over time, the frequency increases. So the frequency of the action potential tells the brain the intensity. Now your brain is amazing, but it's been told when in the embryo that line coming up is from your big toe. It can't see the big toe, but it knows when that light lights lights up in the brain, that's the big toe. But, but do, you, do you have some question? Go ahead. Isn't it also caused by multiple nerves being activated? Well, yeah, yeah. Then you, yeah, you, there's more than one nerve usually too. So. So there's other nerves that, multiple nerves can be activated, but you know, I'm focusing on one of you right now, that multiple nerves can be activated. So the intensity of the stimulus is coded by 
the frequency of the action potential. Is there one per second or five? Five means more intensity. That's how the brain does this. Now, I came from the Vietnam era. I had a draft card. I watched one time a TV where I could have been drafted tomorrow, okay? Some of my cohorts, 58,000 went over and never came back. And some of them came back without their legs. But you know their big toe is still itchy. Even if your leg is missing, your brain can think your big toe is itchy. <coughs> we'll talk about that when we do it. But that's amazing, isn't it? Because the brain doesn't look down. It only has these wires coming up. And if they're sending action potentials, the brain just says that light there is the big toe, even if the big toe is not there. The, the line is still up to the brain. <coughs> Amazing. Okay, so that's action potentials. Is that, Aaron, does that pretty much answer yesterday's questions or confusions? Yeah. Okay. Because the kicker is there's this resting. You have to reach threshold to make this spike. If you have a sub-threshold stimulus, the, the, the receptor still senses it, but the brain doesn't know it, okay? And then you always get this, and then here's another word, there's refractory period, and that's a good word to write down. Refractory is a general term, now away from everything, just say refractory. I'm not going to respond to you. That's what refractory means. A gland can be refractory to hormones. I'm not going to respond to the hormones that I usually do. In this case, the refractory period is a period of time, you notice how the middle of the seconds is on this uh, x-axis, is a period of time when an action, another action potential cannot be evoked. So you can't, during this time, this is too far down to make an action potential. Okay, that's the point. So here's the other thing is, sometimes you can give a nerve a chemical that sends the resting down here. And that's what local anesthetics tend to do. Make for a deeper resting potential so that nerve doesn't fire off. That's what they actually Okay, anybody have any other questions? I think we'll go. Uh, say goodbye to the puppies. They're both kind of tired. And we'll see you tomorrow, right? Or I guess we're in this room for a while too, right? Some of us. <laughs> you want to linger? Just shut that door back there, you know, so you don't get hurt. Thank you. Excellent question.